Amen. Welcome, sanctuary family. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but I've already been rejoicing <clears throat> in the presence of God. Amen. It's been sweet this morning. For several weeks, you know, we've been talking about our inheritance, which is our hope and our future. It is the eternal kingdom of God. We happen to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ to every promise that comes from the Father above. And the kingdom of God belongs to us. It belongs to us. He's already given us the title, the deed to the property. He's already given us the title. We own it. And we know that Jesus is our king. We just sang about him. He is our king. He's also our lawgiver, which is his law is rooted in his love. And he is our judge. He is the judge of all mankind. And we're thrilled to know that because justice is coming. Amen. We've learned that uh, as we put our trust in God, especially as he is our provider, that we can walk, can walk in the supernatural provision that comes from obedient faith. And I want to tell you, God's supernatural provision is way more than our natural provision. I'd rather trust in his provision than mine. Amen. And as we place our trust in God's provision, then we become, the evidence of that is we become frivolous givers instead of takers. You know, there's two types of people in the world today, givers and takers. And you have to be one or the other. But God wants us to be frivolous. Joyful givers, and, and there's lots of joy that comes from that. And, you know, as we reap what we sow, the more we give, we become generous reapers of financial wealth that God can use through us to bless and help others who are in need. So in this series, we've also learned that we can learn God's native language. There is a native language to God's kingdom, and it happens to be his word. As we surrender our hearts to the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, we become the mouthpiece of God and we bring his kingdom to the lives of others by our mouth. Last week, we learned that God is related to us, his citizens, first of all, by virtue of the new birth, because we're born into the kingdom of God through the new birth. We are his children and we are members of his royal family. But we are also related to him by virtue of the new covenant, his covenant of love. His covenant of love. It's his last will and testament. You know, I used to wonder why did we used to call it the old and new testament? I mean, old covenant. Now it's called the old and new testament. Well, the testament is like a will. It tells us what God's will is for our lives. But this last will and testament, our new testament covenant is our legal document that ensures our inheritance. What do you get when you, somebody signs their will at their last will and testament? Somebody is going to inherit something from that person if they have anything left, right? I'm trying to spend all mine before my, I, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but have, this last will and testament of God is signed in the blood of Jesus. Every last will and testament has to be signed. This one's signed in the blood of Jesus and... It is sealed by the Holy Spirit. We get our sealed by a notary public. But God's will is sealed by the Holy Spirit. All of this is our deed to the kingdom and the entire earth. That's right. Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You see, one day soon we will rule and reign with Jesus over the earth. For a thousand years, it will be a kingdom that is ruled in truth, in righteousness, justice, and peace. There won't be any war. There won't be any crooks getting away with murder. Everyone will receive their just reward because Jesus is a just judge. He's a perfect judge. But after that thousand year reign of Christ, heaven will actually come to earth and it will be a new earth that's made perfect, just as it was at creation. So, all God in all of his fullness, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will live with us forever into eternity. That's our inheritance. That's a promise. That's our eternal inheritance. It is a perfect world. If you can imagine that the atmosphere is God's love. 
It's going to be incredible. It's going to be saturated with God's love. Incredible. That's something to shout about. Amen? So if you were not here for these teachings, please go to our YouTube channel. Even if you were here, go to our YouTube channel, which is Sanctuary Church of Jacksonville, and watch them. And in addition, please like it and share it. And also, if you haven't done that, subscribe to the channel. So, um, and we, as we do this, we're actually preaching the kingdom of God because people out in the world, we have viewers from all over the world watching these sermons. They're learning things that they're not being taught in their own churches it's about the kingdom of God because the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. You know, uh, before I go into this message, which is God's kingdom and his enemies, I, I want to bring something up. You know, uh, as we were worshiping, it just came to my mind. You know, the, the, the early Christians, they suffered. The, the apostles were all tortured except for John. Well, he was sent as an uh, exile to a horrible place, island, Patmos. But all of them suffered, and they did not give up their faith because, not because they saw the suffering Christ on the cross, but because they saw the resurrection and what that meant to them, that there is eternal life on the other side of that cross. And they saw, for the first time, their true inheritance. That this world is not all there is, people. And if it is, how wretched are we? If this world is all we have, I don't care if you're the richest man on earth. It's miserable. For the vast majority of the world. And I'm going to tell you, if your Christianity is joyless, this came to me in the shower. <laughs> this morning. If you have a joyous, a joyless a joyless Christianity, I feel bad for you. Because this, this relationship with, with God, the first fruit of love is joy. We need to be filled with God's joy. And why can we have joy in the midst of all that we see in the world today? It's because we know the end of the story. We know that we have an inheritance that is worth living for and worth dying for. So I just want to leave that for you. That's just free of charge. So let's go into our message. Um, God's kingdom. He has an enemy. Every kingdom does. Throughout history, men and women under the influence of satanic forces have sought to dominate their, their neighbors. To kill, steal, and destroy. And that's why every kingdom and every nation has established some kind of military structure or organization such an army navy whatever you and the purpose of it is to either to conquer other nations or to protect its citizens from foreign enemies and since the fall of man war has been a part of life for the vast majority of human beings on the earth throughout history wars bring with it the death of men women and children the destruction of property it brings famine, starvation, and disease, and slavery. War is Satan's weapon of mass destruction against God's property. Everything that he created for his pleasure. Men, women, and children, plants, and animals. The beauty of his magnificent creation is destroyed in war. We know that the kingdom of God has been at war since the great rebellion in heaven. When Lucifer led one third of the angels again, in, into war against God's faithful ones. Against God and his faithful ones. And that's found in Revelations 12 verse 7 through 9. It says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth. And his angels with him. So war didn't just start with Cain and Abel. It started long before that. And it is a war. Between Lucifer, Satan, and his fallen angels against the kingdom of God. 
So God has always maintained an army for the defense of his people against the attacks of their enemies. His provision to protect them has been shown throughout history. In fact, the Old Testament is filled with stories of how God came to the rescue of God's people, of his people, supernaturally. Armies defeated. Armies turning on each other, killing each other. It's the, just read the Old Testament. It's incredible. I want to tell you one story. Remember the story about Elisha and his servant? Uh, that's found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8 through 23. It says, Now the king of Aram, the Arameans, was at war with Israel. And this is speaking of the ten tribes to the north. The northern kingdom, which was called Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah. It was called Judah. So at this time, this king of Aram, Aram, was at war with the Israelites. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God, who happened to be at that time Elisha, talking about the prophet Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel. He says, this is Elisha. He says, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. That's kind of funny because probably not. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. Horses, chariots, and a, a strong, big, fat, a big army. They went by night and surrounded the city of Dothan. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning to have his coffee... An army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. An army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's very comforting. Chariots of fire. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, the army, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria, which happens to be the capital city of Israel. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. They're in the walled city of Samaria, the entire army. So when the king of Israel saw this, saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink. And then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands of the, of, from Aram, the bands from Aram, the raiding parties from this place stopped raiding Israel's territory. You know, and this story has so much to talk about. I love the fact that Elisha asked God to open the eyes of his servant so he could see what he could see in the spirit realm. We need to pray that prayer over each other and especially over our children today. 
We need to pray this prayer. Lord, open their spiritual eyes so they can see. We need to see that we have an enemy that's invisible to the naked eye. We must have the eyes of Christ to see who the enemy actually is. Then he asked God to, to uh, blind the eyes of the army. So they couldn't see. Isn't that much like what happened with the angels in the, in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? In Sodom with Lot. When the, the men of the city came to rape and pillage, they struck them blind so they couldn't see. You know, we need to pray like this over our enemies, over the forces of evil and those who are under the control of the forces of evil. Bring confusion into their camp. But the interesting thing here is that he tells the king of Israel to feed these prisoners of war. They are considered prisoners of war, captured. He says, feed them and give them water and send them back home. And that's why God, Jesus says, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. Amen? Why? Because the result was... They went home. This army went back home, and it says they never bothered them again. You see, you resist Satan, and he will flee. You do it God's way, and you win every time. So we need to realize that we're in a war between the forces of evil and God's kingdom. We're in a war. Whether you want to engage in that battle or not, you are in the war. And like Elisha's servant, we see with our human eyes... That's how satanic forces use human beings to do their be bidding. We can see that in our society today. People say, well, why is it that all these corporations are going woke? Well, if you don't know the behind the scenes story on that, you'll you'll be, you can't believe what's going on. But we do need to realize we are in a war, a spiritual war. And so what we don't see is the angelic army that is at our disposal we need to see that and if it's at our disposal if we will engage in this war for the souls of people especially the children of our world today they're after the children so we need to have the eyes of christ we need to be able to see. And I want to tell you, God showed me this early in my walk with him. Dwight used to say, early in our marriage, he'd say, honey, what is it you need from me? And I said, I need you to see what I see. I need you to see that there is an army. And they're encamped around our family and our property. And they're doing everything they can to destroy us. If we don't see that, we can't fight the battle with the weapons that are powerful. We won't know. I love that song when we were young Christians. It's Amy Grant. He's got his angels watching over me every step I take. Angels watching over me. I'm telling you, I sang that song one day on the way to work. I was almost in a car accident three times between my house and the office, which is four miles. I'm telling you, God had his angels watching over me that same day. I was on my way down to Miami to catch a, a cruise ship, and we lost my watch. My Rolex watch was, fell out of the car. And we drove off, and we had our hamburgers, and we drove off. I know, probably last time I had a McDonald's hamburger. And I get to the resort that we're spending the night at, <clears throat> and I realize my watch is gone. I don't have a clue where it is. So I start praying. Lord, you know where it is. Show me where it is. I found it. I found it. God, I won't give you all the details. I'll tell you, talk about miracle after miracle after miracle. It had been sitting on the ground on a broad daylight, sunshiny day on the parking lot of McDonald's right by a gas station, right by Interstate 95 South. Nobody had seen it laying there for two hours. No one had run over it in their car. I got my watch back. Because I have angels watching over me and everything that belongs to God that's under my care. 
when we understand we have an army of angels who will blind the people who are walking right by it. Walking right by that Rolex watch. That's the God we serve. That's the army that is at our disposal. But you must engage in the battle. They're standing ready for us, the mouthpiece of God, to speak and they will respond. I've lived it. For 43 years I've lived this. We have an angelic army that's at our bidding, ready to get, if you've never read it, I don't know if it's still in print, but Piercing the Darkness, Frank Peretti, incredible book. It's at least 40 years old. I'm telling you, get it, read it. It is powerful. It'll open your eyes to, to how this works. Now, not only do we have an angelic army at our disposal, but God himself, God himself is a mighty warrior who comes to our defense against our enemy. Exodus 15, verse 3 through 6. Speaking of <clears throat> what God himself did to the uh, Pharaoh's army, he says, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. The Lord Almighty is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he has hurled into the sea. It was God who did it. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. God is our defense. As citizens of the kingdom of God, we are also enlisted into his army. And we have a common enemy. You know, it's really sad. I mean, when I was a baby Christian and a few years before that, you know, we, there was a song. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cr cross of Jesus. Listen, people, we don't sing like that anymore. We don't have that theology anymore. In the modern day church, we're on, we're not on a battleship, we're on a cruise ship. We're just cruising along because Jesus did it all. I got news for you. That's why our nation is in the condition it's in. Because the church has been on a wall, absent without leave. They don't even know they're commissioned into the army. They don't even know they got a mission. That's why I preach like I do. You you have no excuse. Amen. No excuse. You know now. You now know. You are enlisted into God's army. You have been drafted. You didn't have a choice. You're in. So Ephesians 6 verse 12 tells us that we have a common enemy. He says our struggle is not. You know what? I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Because we've heard this before. But we're going to learn some more. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. But against the rulers. Against the authorities. Against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We sang that. Your name is above all powers and positions. How does it go? Dominions. Everything that this is speaking of. Against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have, there is a hierarchy of demonic power that is over the entire earth. There are angelic, satanic angelic beings. They weren't, once were angels. Now they're archangels of evil. And they are assigned positions over the nations and over cities. And over towns. And over families. Jesus also tells us in John 10.10. 10, that the thief. Satan comes to steal. To kill. To destroy. But I have come that they may have life. And have it to the full. I hate it when God gets blamed for everything evil. Oh. Uncle Tommy died. And I guess God wanted him in heaven. No. No. Death comes from the devil. Jesus gets blamed for everything bad. And nobody gives thanks for what he does for everybody that's so good. We have an enemy. Satan. He is the one who came to kill. To kill. To kill. Anything that's about death is satanic. The abortion issue is satanic. It's killing innocent babies. Kill, steal, and destroy. 
Jesus came to have, that we might have life to the fullest. We must understand in our hearts that people are not the problem, nor are they our enemy. They're not, no matter what they've done. I don't care what they've done to you. The real enemy is the demonic being that controls that person's behavior or influences it. So in order to win a battle, any war, you need to know who your enemy is. Today, we need to know who our enemy is <clears throat> because we have to, if you don't know what the enemy is, you won't know how to fight the enemy. We have to fight with weapons that are aimed at the heart of the kingdom of darkness. God has given us our armor to protect us, and he has given us his word, which is the sword of the spirit, as our weapon to defeat our enemy. Again, most of you know this, but we're going to review it. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18 says, therefore. Why therefore? What's before the therefore? What's it there for? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities in high places. We're at war. Therefore, if you're at war, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if, but when it comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Stand. And after you've done everything, stand. You know, God expects us to do something. You got to do something. But after you've done everything you can do, being led by the Spirit, you stand. You take your stand. You plant your flag. You don't let the enemy mow you down. Stand firm then. Stand firm then. What? With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. People, we got to know the truth. The truth, Jesus is the truth. The word of God is truth. CNN, NBC, FOX is not truth. None of it is true. This is true. So put that on. Put on the truth with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Breastplate, protect your heart. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with God and with your neighbor? Because if you're not at peace with your neighbor, you don't have the gospel of peace. You're not fitted. You're not ready. You know, wounded warriors aren't much good to people. God will use us. But we're not going to be steady. We're unstable in all of our ways if we're not at peace with our brethren. Especially in a marriage. I'm telling you what. The enemy attacks marriage because if he can destabilize your marriage and your relationship with your spouse, he has won the battle. You're not going to be effective very, much in, very, very effective in anything else. So in, in addition to all of this, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith. And that is what do you place your faith in? It'll protect you from the fiery darts of the enemy. But what do you place your faith in? You see, I've seen in this last several years that people put their faith in the government. They put their faith in Fauci. They put their faith in doctors and hospitals. And a lot of them are dead or wounded, injured, because that's what they put their faith in rather than the truth, which is Jesus and his word. They didn't have the, the shield of faith on in front of them to protect them from the fiery darts of the enemy. With, and he says, the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. Helmet. What's the purpose of a helmet? Protects your mind. It protects your head. A bullet to the head, you're pretty dead. That's a good meme. A bullet to the head and you're dead, right? God says, no, put on your helmet of salvation. And what is the helmet? It is whatever it takes to protect your mind. Because as a, as a man thinks, so he is. What a mind, man believes goes from here to here in his heart determines his actions. 
What do you believe? Who are you listening to? Put on the helmet of salvation, which is the mind of Christ. That's what it is. It's the mind of Christ. We need the mind of Christ. So God has already told us. He's given it to us. But we have to see things through his eyes. He sees everything. He is wisdom. He is wisdom. It's Proverbs, seek wisdom. Seek wisdom. It comes from the mind of Christ. It comes from the fear of the Lord. Seek wisdom. Put on your helmet. It will protect you from the from being dead. Amen. And then he gives you the, the word of God, which is, oh, by the way, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay. So what is our, that's, we talked about our defensive weapons. Now our offensive weapon is the word of God. It's the sword of the spirit. And then he says, after you have all that and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. You can pray in English and you can pray in the spirit. I can tell you when I need serious prayer power, I'm praying in tongues. There is a supernatural impartation of God's power and wisdom when we pray in tongues. And why people resist this gift is beyond me. You don't have what you need to defeat the enemy. In my opinion. So it says pray um, in the spirit on all occasions. With all kinds of prayers and requests. Pray all the time. With this in mind be alert. And always keep praying for the saints. Why? Because we're all under attack. All of us are under attack. We are the enemy of the kingdom of darkness. So Satan and his spiritual rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. That's a lot to talk about, but that's a whole sermon and teaching on that. They were defeated on the cross of Jesus Christ when and only because Jesus, in complete obedience to his heavenly father, he laid down. He, he laid himself on the altar. It was a cross. He laid himself down. Nobody put him there. He did it. He laid it down to receive the full wrath of God for all the sins of humanity. And what looked like defeat to the enemies of God, God used to bring victory to his kingdom and to us who are his royal, loyal subjects. Are you a royal, loyal subject? I am. Uh, Revelation 1, 17 and 18 says, when I saw him, the risen Christ, this is John, the apostle John, while he's on the island of Patmos in exile, probably living in a cave, has a vision. And he says, when I saw him, the risen Christ, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. You know, when I read this, I think about John. He was called the one Jesus loved. He was the one who was so open in his affection to Jesus. Right? He was, he calls himself the one Jesus loved. Because they had a, a very deep love relationship. And yet, when he saw Jesus in heaven, on his throne, he fell at his feet as if he, he fell at his feet as if he were dead. You know, that song, I can only imagine, I can only imagine what it will be like when I see you face to face. Will I be able to stand? No. Will I fall to my knees? Will I even be able to speak? Will I be able to speak at all? When we see Jesus, as he is now, and I'm going to tell you, I ask God, Lord Jesus, open my eyes, my spiritual eyes to see you as you are now. Because when John, who knew him intimately, saw him, he fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and he said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. 
And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to, of death and Hades. Praise God. Jesus defeated Satan. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He lives now and forevermore. And those of us who are in Christ, who have been baptized into him, and I'm not talking about water baptism. I'm talking about the spiritual rebirth when we are, we are baptized into Christ. We also am alive forever and ever. Amen? So, why are we in this war? Satan's great ambition is to keep every man and woman into subjection to himself. We became slaves to sin and Satan when we entered into his rebellion against God through our disobedience to God's word and his will. And although there have been many men and women, great men and women of God throughout history that the Bible calls righteous, and they're righteous by faith just like we are, only one man perfectly obeyed God's laws and resisted Satan's temptations, Satan's attempts to cause him to sin. Jesus resisted all the temptations we will ever face or experience. You know, there's not, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin when you give in to temptation. Hebrews 4, 4, 14 and 15 tells us this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess or profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he didn't sin. So Jesus is our example. He has told us that he is the way to the Father and that we are to take up our cross and follow him. So, if we're to follow him, if we must follow him, then we need, to know, we need to look at his journey so we know how that works. Amen? So, let's <clears throat> talk about his journey. First of all, Jesus was born into a religious culture that had been hijacked by religious leaders who had no concern for their fellow Jews. Who were at that time under terribly oppressed by a very greedy and cruel pagan Roman government. He grew up in a lower income, working class family. He was exposed as a young child. Growing up, he was exposed to crucifixions. So these were common forms of execution and terrorism for anyone who opposed the government or who committed the smallest of crimes. So Jesus saw this. He saw People stoned to death by the Jews themselves for any infraction against the law of Moses. He saw people living in abject poverty. He saw demon-possessed people. He saw sickness, disease, and death. He saw with his own eyes the suffering of God's chosen people, which was all the result of satanic forces who happened to be the enemies of God's kingdom. So in spite of everything that he was exposed to, for 30 years, he lived a simple life of obedience. He was a faithful son to his mom and dad. He was faithful to work with his hands as a carpenter to provide care for his widowed mother and his brothers and sisters until he reached the age of 30, because that's the age when the Levites began their service in the temple. Until then, Jesus remained in the shadows, and then he stepped out of obscurity into his public ministry. So his first step on this journey began when he received the baptism of repentance. Matthew 3, 13 through 15 says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. 
So although Jesus had never sinned, he identified himself will, with sinful humanity by submitting to John's baptism, which is in obedience to God's will, that he become the suffering servant spoken about by the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 53, verse 1 through 12, it talks about this suffering servant. It says, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Speaking about Jesus, he says he grew up in about 800 years before Jesus was born, by the way. This was prophesied about Jesus. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed by our, for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned in our own way, to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet... Who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin... He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils among the strong, because he poured out his life unto death. And was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressions. Transgressors. When Jesus was on the cross. And he said father forgive them. They don't know what they do. That was his intercession for us. And today he even continues to intercede for us. Before the father. So Jesus. After his baptism by John. He was anointed. For service by the power of the Holy Spirit. So first he goes into the water of baptism. John's baptism. Which was a baptism for repentance of sin. Even though he didn't sin. He never sinned. He went through the process. The next step was. In Matthew 3.16. Verse 7, 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized. By John. He went up out of the water. At that moment heaven was opened. And he saw the spirit of God. Descending like a dove. And lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So at this point, And as Christians. As you've gone through the waters of baptism. In repentance. You've repented of your sins. You come out of the waters. And the Holy Spirit declares you his child. This is my son. This is my daughter. In whom I'm well pleased. God the Father pronounced his sonship upon Jesus. In the same way, we become his sons and daughters when we repent of our wicked ways to follow Jesus in obedience to his Father. We follow Jesus. We take up our cross. We crucify our flesh. And we follow Jesus. We also need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to receive his power to serve God and to serve God alone. And to do the works that Jesus did. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As children of God, we will be tested. 
Testing is either to reveal our character or to develop our character. So once we become a child of God, there's a little time that God allows us to be baby Christians like little babies, all excited and everything. And then the testing starts and it's not fun. It's not fun. But just like Jesus will be tested in the desert just as the children of Israel were tested during their 40 years of wandering. That's found in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. It says this, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would uh, obey his or keep his commands. God did that for the Israelites, and he, does, and he allows it to happen to us. We go through the desert experience where we're tested to see if we'll obey God. We're going to be put in situations all the time. Will you obey God? Jesus likewise was also tested in this way. Matthew 4, 1 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. To be tempted is to be tested. You take a test. Pass or fail. Paul tells us that we should, uh, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he tells us we should examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Uh, unless, of course, you fail the test. Everyone who's a professing Christian must test themselves. Will you obey God? 2 Corinthians 8, 8 tells us, I am not commanding you. This is Paul, the apostle, speaking to the church at Corinth. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. He's talking about giving. He's telling, he said, I want to test your sincerity, the sincerity of your love, because are you going to give to these people in need? So our greatest battle as citizens of God's kingdom is to resist temptation. The temptation to serve the lusts of the flesh and our own needs. Our human mind and our nature, human nature, supports the idea that we have the power and the right to satisfy our own needs. And Satan... Started out tempting Jesus to do the same thing. <clears throat> Matthew 4, 2 and 3 says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Well, heck, Jesus turned water into wine right after this happened. He could have turned bread, stones into bread to feed himself. But Jesus' response to Satan indicates that every, every single person must recognize his or her utter dependence upon God's word. Jesus responded to Satan's temptation with his mighty weapon, which is God's word. And he answered him in Matthew 4.4. 4, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You know... One thing that Satan said to him, he says, if you are the son of God. Jesus had just come out of the baptism water 40 days earlier because he'd been fasting for 40 days when this happened. And when he did, the, Father God, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. So Satan is questioning Jesus's identity. This is why we have this war today against a person's identity. Your identity is, I got to tell you something, God's word, it'll tell you. Your identity is not the color of your skin. It's not whether you're male or female, but you are one or the other. Amen. It's not that you're uh, a Democrat or Republican, although that does tell you something about your identity. Your real identity is either you're a child of God or you're not. Either God is your father or he isn't. That's who your identity is. Well, Satan attacks that first. If you're the son of God, then just tell these rocks to turn into bread. 
Amen? But Jesus said it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. More important than bread that you eat when you're hungry is the word of God. Later, Jesus told his disciples in John 4, 32 and th through 34, it says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So if we're followers of Christ, this is our food as well. To do the will of the Father. Amen? And to finish his work. Jesus was tempted to use his power to fulfill his own needs. People, this is a real problem in the body of Christ. Rather than to use God's power to fulfill his God-given mission. You see, God gives us power to fulfill his mission. Not to make ourselves rich. Not to make ourselves popular or powerful. Or fulfill our own needs and desires. It's, he gives us the power to fulfill God's mission on the earth. Amen? Amen. And, and Jesus, with Jesus, his mission was to meet all the needs of fallen humanity. We must rest in the heart knowledge, which is actually trust or faith. That we, because we belong to God, we belong to Jesus, he will meet all of our needs, period. He will meet all of them. When we trust God to meet our needs, then we can concentrate our efforts on serving the Lord and the people that he loves. The second temptation of Christ involves deception. People, this is everything we go through. We all go through this. The second one involves deception, using the God of word, taking it out of context. There's so much of God's word that is taken out of context in the body of Christ or in the church that leads us astray. Matthew 4, verse 5 and 6 says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If, there it is again, if you are the son of God. There's that identity question. That's questioning God's word. He said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you won't strike your foot against a stone. So just as Satan tempted Eve in the garden, questioning the integrity of God's word, he challenged the reliability of God's spoken word over Jesus. In Matthew 3, 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. He did it again. So the temptation here is to challenge God's word regarding the sonship of Jesus by testing God. So we're tempted to test God. We want visible, miraculous proof that he says he is who he is. But God's word forbids it. Because we are simply to place our faith in him and his word and simply obey. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. Deuteronomy 6 verse 16 says, Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa, speaking to the Israelites who had been taken out of Egypt. And in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6 and 10 through 10 says, speaking about the Israelites in the desert, it says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. So Satan is tempting Jesus to jump off this cliff because after all, if you're son, the son of God, you know, his angels will catch you and you won't hurt yourself. In other words, God's promises of protection, but God says, <laughs> Psalm 91 verse 11 says this, uh, see Satan's perverting God's word. Because it actually does say something like that. It says in Psalm 91, 11, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways and in all of your ways of obedience and service. 
In other words, God's promise of protection and provision are for those who are walking in his ways, in obedience to his commands and in his service. When we foolishly walk in our own ways and disregard his will and his word, when we disregard God's word, when we disregard his word, his will, we do it our way, our will, we're not under this protection. We're not. We're not under the protection of God because we've come under, out from under the blessing. The blessing comes through obedience. When we're walking in his ways, we're walking under his provision of protection and finances and everything we need. But when we do it our own way, we are outside the will of God. We're outside. Do we need a visual on that? When we foolishly walk in our own ways, disregarding his will and his word to serve other gods, and which is primarily ourselves, we find ourselves in grave danger. That's period. Jesus responded to Satan's deception with his weapon, the word of God. Matthew 4, 7 says this. Jesus answered him and he said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Amen. Once again, Satan attempted to entice Jesus to sin against God by offering him the easy road to his destination. Jesus knew where he was going and what he was doing. He knew what the mission was. And Satan is thinking, I'm going to tempt him to give him what he was going after without him having to go through the cross. He offered the kingdoms of this world and all of their splendor without showing their sin and deprivation. However, Jesus came to deliver the world from the power of sin. This was the father's purpose in sending him. That was his mission. So Satan tempted Jesus to bypass the cross. In Matthew 4 verse 8 and 9. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you. If you will bow down and worship me. Well, how many people have sold their souls to the devil for fame and fortune? Most of the industry, music industry and most of the uh, Hollywood and most of the politicians around the world today have sold their souls to the devil. They've made a compact. They've made a contract. They've made covenant with the devil. And Jesus responded... With the sword of the spirit. In Matthew 4.10 he said. Away from me Satan. For it is written. Worship the Lord your God. And serve him only. So you know we're going to be all tempted. To go the easy route. To bypass the will of God. For our lives. By serving other gods. Which primarily is ourselves. We must choose to worship the Lord our God. And serve him only. Matthew 4.11 says, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Now at this point, Satan temporarily left Jesus. Though the conflict or the battle had barely begun, the pattern of obedience and trust had been established. He had learned to resist the devil. And you and I must also learn to resist the devil. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God, his will, his work. Submit yourself, surrender, put yourself under the authority of God and his will, which is in his word. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. The devil comes at you with a temptation. Be gone from me, Satan. No, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I refuse to do this, which you'd say. I refuse to be obedient to you. I will obey God no matter what it means. 
Whatever it says, I'll do it. So you got to submit yourself to the word of God and his will. Resist him and he will flee. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 says, be self-controlled and alert. We must be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Listen, you're not alone. Every single child of God is facing the same battle. When we resist Satan, here's the good news. Angelic help is not some passing blessing, but it is a sustained one. It continues. Jesus had refused to relieve his hunger by turning stones into bread. And now he is fed supernaturally. He had refused to throw himself off the temple heights in the hope of angelic help. Now angels feed him. He had refused to take the shortcut to inherit the kingdoms of the world. Now he, re he fulfills scripture and his mission, his divine destiny, by beginning his ministry and proclaiming the kingdom of God. You know, it's after that we have been tested. Now we can enter into the fullness of God's plan and purpose for our lives in the world. But we must pass some tests along the way. We cannot be trusted with the power to do good if we might use that power to serve self. We are called to fulfill our divine destiny in Christ. We are joint, we as joint uh, heirs with him are called to be partakers in his ministry on the earth. To become armed and outfitted for battle, disciplined soldiers of his kingdom. Now, apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. I can tell you there's times I feel completely weak and worthless. I feel, what am I doing here? I want to quit. I want to throw in the towel like anyone who's just tired, just tired. We all, but God says, don't be weary in doing good. I can't do anything apart from Christ. I can't get up here and teach this lesson apart from Christ. I know I can't. I'm very aware of it. I'm aware of it. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. That's why he has given us everything we need for life and prosperity. To defeat the enemy of our soul and to participate in the dis deliverance of others who are spiritually oppressed, spiritually blinded, and enslaved to sin and Satan. He's given us everything we need. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5 says this. Again, Paul the Apostle, who's been through everything. I mean, he's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's been let down a wall. I, he's been through hell in a handbasket. Nobody's been tested like this man, in my opinion. Not me. I've been through what he's been through. And he says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may, have, may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. But though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know what? It belongs in you. It starts with you as an individual. It, that's where it starts. We must take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Anything that opposes the word of God. And the sad thing is today... I travel a lot. I meet a lot of people. I've met a lot of professing Christians. And I got to tell you, there is such a deficit of the word of God in the church. There is such, I'm talking biblical illiteracy among people who've been Christians for years. Years. And I know they're Christians. They've been drinking milk for so long. They have no understanding of anything that might strengthen them and make them powerful for the kingdom of God. 
What a tragedy. What a tragedy. What a tragedy that the only thing you know about the Bible is that you're saved. Because Jesus did it all. What a tragedy that you don't know the word of God so you cannot possibly defend it. You cannot possibly teach it. You cannot possibly preach it. You can't pray it over somebody. You can't even speak it into existence. What a tragedy. But that's not what God expects from us. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So if you've hungered and thirsted, have you made the first step in the journey that leads to victory in this life and in the life to come? Eternity is a really long time. It's forever. It never ends. The question for your eternal self, your eternal soul, that part of you that never dies hangs in the balance. The first step is to acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of a savior. Amen. We all need that. Jesus has paid the price for our sins through his death on the cross. He took upon himself the full extent of God's wrath for every sin, every man or woman has ever committed. He is the king of his eternal kingdom, but he's also our sinless savior. That first step requires a turnaround in your thinking, which will result in a turnaround in your behavior. This is called repentance. And the gospel without repentance is no gospel at all. Have you surrendered to him and made him your Lord? If he is your Lord, then his Holy Spirit has taken up residence inside your heart to help you walk in obedience to his commands. We call this the born again experience. You are now a child of the king. God is your father and you are a member of his royal family. And that's wonderful news. Now, if you are a child of God, you're also a soldier in God's army. Question is, are you AWOL? Absent without leave. Are you so busy doing your own thing, serving yourself, that you are not at your duty station and ready for combat? If so, perhaps you need to recommit your life to the Lord. Or perhaps you're dealing with an area of sin in your life. You might be struggling with fornication, pornography, bitterness. I'll tell you the big one, bitterness, bitterness and anger. Or with drug and alcohol abuse. There, and the question is, have you resisted Satan? The Bible says that if you resist him, he will flee. I just want to say this morning, whatever your need Whatever holds you back from becoming the person God can use for his purpose. Please come forward for prayer. Because we do have prayer warriors in our church. And they will pray for you. We all need to be armed and ready. To, f to fight on behalf of our king and his kingdom. Amen. Let's close. Lord, your word is powerful. It's the bread of life. Thank you for feeding us this morning. Use it, Lord, to transform us. To transform our thinking and then our behavior. We surrender all, Lord. We surrender to the work of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We pray, oh God, that you would pour out your spirit in this church. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit of truth. Break through every stronghold of the enemy. Every bondage. Especially the sin of unforgiveness and bitterness, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way in our hearts and our lives today. Strengthen us and encourage us. Remind us of your word. And give us the grace to obey. We thank you for your mercy. that's poured out so richly over our lives. We thank you for your love. 
that just flows to us and through us to other people. Let it flow, Lord God. Let it flow like a river. Let us be your ambassadors of love in the earth, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. As I said, please come for prayer if you need it for any reason. And I love you very much. Love you so much.